Hello everybody, it's uh, Nate here from NMI When You Need More Info. I just wanted to do, do a brief introduction, obviously, with a slight delay between episodes. We decided to have a little bit of a holiday break between um, the episodes coming out and also then we had some technical difficulties after our latest Guardians of the Galaxy review, <clears throat> which was recorded about a week and a half ago. But we do hope you've enjoyed listening with us and we do hope you look forward to coming back in the future for all the lovely episodes we hope to be doing for you. Uh, we've got some good ones planned in the near future. And yeah, but uh, I will let you get to it and enjoy the episode. Speak to you soon, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Hooked on that podcast with the informers. Come and join us for a review today. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to NMI When You Need More Info, a podcast spawn the worlds of movies, video games, and TV shows. I'm your host, Nate, and it is lovely to be back today, everyone. Uh, we've had a nice little interval break with holidays and people just, you know, having having a life. You know, everyone's got to have a life, people, especially transitioning into the spring-summer season. But yeah, it's good to be back, people, and we're enjoying with uh, four, uh, three, I was about to say four, four of us today, but three lovely guests included, including someone lovely new today. But before we introduce them, let's uh, hand it over to returning host Chaz and James. How are you guys doing since we last been? Yeah, I'm really, really good. I'm, I, I think I might change my name to uh, Dave if we are. If I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff with Chaz because we need we, <laughs> we need to have a Chaz and Dave. But no, I've been doing good. Um, not a huge amount to support. Been playing a lot of Age of Wonders Four this week so that came out on Tuesday, so I'm going to big up that game. It's a nice four work strategy fantasy game. Nice. Uh, we get there are a lot of games at the moment. A lot of games coming out at the moment. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. How are we, up, Chaz? Yeah, I'm good. I've uh, been enjoying all the extra days off we've had off in uh, the UK, dodging the rain. I've uh, been watching a little bit of The Orville recently, which was a recommendation from Nate, enjoying that a lot. Very good, um, well, as someone who grew up watching Star Trek, um, it's quite relatable, but it's also kind of like kind of like a, you know, kind of a parody take, but also quite a lot of sincerity there. So yeah, enjoying that one a lot. Honestly, as we discussed, when I first heard Seth MacFarlane's Star Trek, I was like, oh no, what's he going to, he's going to destroy it. And then it turns out it's actually really, really well done. Surprisingly respectful. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm just getting to the tail end of season one. So yeah, I got a couple of other seasons of that. Oh, it gets a lot, it gets a lot deeper and heavier and the and the effects in the show are brilliant for that that type of show as well it's and the practical makeup actually yeah. some of that's really yeah but like i said I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot i was looking for something fairly light-hearted to watch but with some substance and it's hitting the spot so far no but glad glad to hear it glad to hear it indeed so uh yeah obviously you know with nmi we like to have a, a new host come on every now and then they they want to come in they can join for the show and maybe bring new topics along with them but uh as you know from the review title today we are going to be doing a guardians of the galaxy volume 3 review and we've got a new uh, host today uh everybody welcome to towers uh welcome to the show towers hi there it's uh it's good to be on nice to speak to you all yeah hopefully i won't ruin it yeah, you you won't ruin it. It'll be fine. No, uh, so uh, towers. Um, so we we usually ask like, some people some questions, but like, what what you know, what what sort of games you into stuff like? What sort of films you into? You know, just get a sense of who who you are. Oh, I'm really eclectic and all over the place. Um, it's quite ironic that one of my first things on this podcast of all the things, all the subjects that I would love to talk, uh, I'm on a Marvel one, and I'm I'm probably not not one of the biggest Marvel fans, but I'm happy to you know I do I am a fan of James Gunn and. Um, the Guardians, the Guardians trilogy is is uh, has been has been pretty much my only thing that has like latched me on to the Marvel franchise, apart from the main overarching you know story story movies with the with the big events that were happening. But then beyond that, um, I'm a big fan of film. I do love epics, you know Martin Scorsese, um, Francis Coppola, you know po- Apocalypse Now. I do love epics and and just really good. Um, they call them like Criterion Collection style films, so like films that are just really well made and and have amazing plots and interesting storylines i i really like and all the way down to like weird things i have a really eclectic taste for things you see i mean it's the best way to be sometimes you know when it comes to like if you see my music well as you guys know my music journalist is very very to say the least uh but no obviously you know speaking of us um a really scarred people like that obviously you know he falls in that category as well um quick question for you because obviously i know Chaz, you've recently just seen this uh, film in the past couple of years question for you how do you feel about the gladiator 2 movie happening it, 
this is something that I've actually not looked into, but I've heard it by name that it's happening. It's a direct but, sequel. Yeah, it's yes. Yeah, so truly a direct sequel continuation it's following of events lucius the, the boy from the first one what from what uh, people are gathering okay okay and uh it's a new cat new actor playing the role so paul mascal who was a recent academy award nominee for um i can't remember the movie he was in recently um but it was for best actor after sun i believe it was called i, I guess a direct sequel is 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 cutting it a little bit loose because the book is closed on on the, like spoilers but the <laughs> it's, it's a long time since spoilers for that but it's a it's a, it's a pretty much the book is closed. In oh Gladiator. yeah, it's a fantastic movie. I rewatched it. I think a couple of months ago or like half a year ago, and it was still just as phenomenal. It was great. Um, um, was it Joaquin Phoenix right playing? It's like I I keep forgetting that the that, that Phoenix was was in that role yeah. in uh, playing the the emperor. Um, and uh, well, Richard, Emperor's son, uh, Augustus's Richard son, Armitage right? as well. Yeah, and then it becomes the emperor. He was phenomenal in that role. It was yeah, fantastic. But yeah, I was um with that film. It's like the original was so well-rounded as a whole in itself that it is kind of hard to see how they would continue it on. And I hope that it's not one of those films that falls into the category of um, they're making it for the sake of name recognition. I hope they do justice to the original because, yeah, like you said, I've only seen the first one a couple of years back and it's, it's amazing. Like You wouldn't think it was over 20 years old at this yeah. point. Yeah, uh, 2000 or 2001, yeah, it's over 20 years old now. It is kind of keeping with... Um a lot of actual real tales in Roman history. I couldn't give you examples off the top of my head, but what I've been exposed to with actual Roman history is that there tends to be a lot of tales that live on through generations, you know, lineage and people coming back into it's a very long storyline as, as most of us know about the Republic and the Empire and everything. So I know it's going to follow from the sound of the, there's a, there's, there was multiple emperors within a short period of time and it's going to be following like the following of like the tragedy and like the betrayal of like certain emperors. So it's going to take a different spin on the approach, which will be interesting. But also I do, I do want to add like this little comment in here. The, uh, the daddy of the internet is rumored to be coming into it as well, which is a, uh, Quite interesting, Sally. His agent is, you know, who I'm gonna have to enlighten who is the daddy of the internet? The daddy on the internet, yeah. Good old Pedro Pascal. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, his agent, his his agent needs a raise, in my opinion. Like, you know, like getting him in that many projects at the moment, like some of the biggest projects in existence. Speaking of Pedro Pascal, I saw um, I always forget the title, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. That's it, yeah. Yeah. And because I'm not like the biggest Nick Cage fan, to be honest, but um. I kind of was like, I, I had a recommendation from a friend, not Nate for once. Um, and I went in because I had a spare afternoon. And you know what? It was pretty good. And Pedro Pascal was probably the best thing about that movie. He was just so endearing in it. I, lo- I love that film. So just just saying. But I do also like Nick Cage. So uh, it's just... Uh... I know I read uh, docu- I know I read uh, reviews possibly that the only reason Nicolas Cage agreed to do it because he was approached six times for the film was because Pedro Pascal is actually a real life massive Nick Cage fan so he that's how the approach was brought in bringing him in so it's very um, easy to bring that to the stage right oh I yeah mean, I've I've yet to watch it actually oh. I, I I've it's been on I know people will scoff at me but like it's been actually something I do want to sit down and watch once but I just know it's going to be a silly fun time. Right, that sounds like yeah. What that it's it's a fun be. movie. Yeah, you should do a double picture that and Renfield because that's out to watch now, I believe oh, as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in Renfield. The trailers look good. Jog my memory about uh, Renfield. It's the, Dra- it's the Nick Cage Dracula yes, it's the Nick Cage movie, Dracula yeah. one. Thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah, yeah that does look funny. There's a whole slew of films that have just come out recently. Like, um, I still need to watch Cocaine Bear. Uh, yeah, and uh, that Renfield. That's Ray Liotta's movie. last on-screen uh, movie. No, it turns role, out there are there are a few projects well, that he's going to be, be more, in post. Yeah. yeah, post his um post. But that that's the most recent actual uh, depiction I've heard. I've heard he's quite good in the movie. To be fair, Cocaine Bear. I feel like that's one of those ones where we've got to like um, just go to someone's house with some beers and just have a laugh, basically. I mean, could you review it drunk? That would be <laughs> that would be an edit, possible it, editing mm, hell for oh me. Oh god. <laughs> I mean, that would be... I'm gonna, I would come up with some absolute... I'd be fucking hilarious. Rabble. Yeah. But speaking of reviews, people, obviously, you know, we like to, um, you know, have, have a lovely intro, and it takes about five, ten minutes usually with someone who coming in. But obviously, speaking of reviews, we are doing today the Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, the last iteration for James Gunn's uh, Volume 3 for, um, yeah, it's just come out recently. So obviously, you know, as you know, uh, standard people who've been here before, we do a non-spoiler review section and then we go into a, <clears throat> sorry, we go into a clearly stated spoiler section at the end so you have um, 
time to actually like you know prepare yourself if you want to go away come back to listen to the spoiler discussion afterwards so yeah so right what we do is we tend to go around for like a few short initial impressions of the movie and then we go through a list of things that we like to actually talk about i'll you know guide us through that and then we'll give our final reviews at the end so since Towers is the new person here today, um, do you have any like short initial impressions of the film? So first off, just before we get into it, I've not actually looked into why is this James Gunn's... Is this James Gunn's last directorial Marvel yes. inclusion? So right? he is taking over DC movies. He is in charge of so DC studios So it's conflict of now. interest, right? It's more the case of like, I think like when he, he's well, taking over... just busy. Yeah, he's running the entirety of DC studios now. Right, okay. And, he, and he's actually directing the next Superman movie. Okay. He's actually written and directing. There's actually um, a really nice homage. So his father passed away recently and... Um, he was a big proponent, I believe, of like James's work and well, writing the tough, film. Right? Yeah, with Superman, and everything. Turns out the release date for the Superman movie is the anniversary of his father. Okay. So I don't know if it was his birthday or of his of his passing, but and his his James's brother actually actually said to him, "Is James quite vocal about that, or is he?" He actually he actually put that out online. That. Like his okay, brother was the okay. one who actually like noted to James, "This is that." Have you noticed the date of the release date for this yeah. movie? And he only realized afterwards that the release date was announced, but. It's the whole controversy of James Gunn coming in and saying, listen, we're doing a new Superman. It's going to be the earlier days. He's also stated it's not going to be in his usual Guardians like movie style. It's not going to be like how 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 people envision his movies are going to be like heavy. But there'll probably be musical elements in there, possibly. Or it might be taking the more classical cinematic approach to it. I mean, that's what you would expect, right? Like you're moving entirely different themes. Yeah, and obviously we've been, we've literally starting off an entirely new like because basically the Flash is coming out yeah. and Superman is going to be the new iteration of everything and it's called Superman Legacy is going to be a whole thing, but yeah no this is James Gunn's like final um, yeah. like Guardians also this is um, it's been stated it's also a few of the cast members final performances in the movie so um, Dave Bautista um, Zoe as well is Zoe Saldana, Zoe Saldana like, yeah. So yeah, obviously you know uh, this is uh, Zoe Saldana's final performance as well. For some reason, my uh, we had, my, may have had a minor technical difficulty there. People by me accidentally clicking the record button because my mouse turned off. I won't do that in the future. But yeah, so um, but it has been known that actually with James going over to DC fully now, that there are possible talkings of like ca- actors who he always works with transferring over to oh, that's DC. Be a thing, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, his his wife is in a lot of the projects. He yeah. she was in the new Guardians movie as well. And you said about Dave Bautista as well. I actually think like of all the Guardians films, in in a strange way, um, I always feel like really indifferent towards Marvel films. But I I do notice Dave Bautista Drax's character actually like I feel has had a more cleaner progression arc and develop character development over the films so like I think this is actually I think it's kind of a nice thing to end on with Drax because you can kind of tell that that Dave Dave put it all into his performance um on a contrast to that I don't mean to be slightly critical but kind of feels like Zoe's before it's very difficult I guess to play somebody an, an amnesiatic character right where, where it's she's she's out of she's out of the past and like the whole situation like that's already established for the thing so yeah it's uh i i'm not sure how i felt about her performance i that. actually really like that performance so I, I must admit uh well no i just i i, I just did i thought sorry's performance was great just seeing the difference in the characters and there's also good. There's also good reason we've seen previous films as, as to why those characters are different because you didn't have the uh, first or second uh, film to build that relationship with uh, Star Lord. So it's like you know where her character started at the start of First Guardians. You you, you can understand how she's developed in, in this more hard edged way. Yeah, I was going to say it, it is weird to have a character that's forgotten everything in your third film or everything of the characters that previously were there, but. Yeah, she does a good job with the situation. Um, but but yeah, you, you say about about the development of the character, but technically, let's let's just say this is a version two of the character, a fresh slate. Technically, right? You could say that. Uh, yeah. I, I I appreciate though, like the she handled the performance in my opinion, like really really well. It's just that it kind of I don't I don't know what to say. Is it is it like tropey? It was just kind of how I expected her character to be. Okay. So yeah. it kind of didn't really shock. Nothing really shocked me about I mean, about the performance. I mean, 
So I think when it comes to uh, Gamora's character, like I, I do like the fact that we'll get we'll probably get more into the character's de- uh, you know depths later on. I do like her performance because it is a paradigm shift to more how she was in the first film, but with a more edgier tone. I think like in the first film, obviously she's still a daughter of Thanos, and um, you know how that how that plays out. And obviously now she's got a whole new narrative in regards to how her character is driven going forward. But, um, so, so obviously, you know, um, going off of like initial thoughts of the movie, like in general, how, how do, how do you feel about the film in general? Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for sidetracking things, but in general, I, I, I quite liked it. Like one of my favorite characters of the Guardians group has been Rocket Raccoon. And in the first two films, he's almost like this kind of like side character that is kind of just shoved aside in a way that's kind of like, like, oh, Rocket, it's just you. It's just you behaving. It's like rocket, but like still really funny and great to see on screen, um, with with some of the kind of like behaviors of like like being very well. What's the what's the word for it? Where you where you're a thief thievery, it's it's very scoundrel type character. Yeah, yeah, essentially like a lovable scoundrel. And Bradley Cooper plays the performance. I did not expect when I first saw the first film, and I knew Bradley Cooper was going to be doing Rocket. I did not expect the voice I got, which was fantastic, and he's 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 really continued on with it. And then to get the backstory now, like and how that plays out later on, I I think I think it was really really good, and it helped to reinforce the concept of of Rocket's character. I do think that was probably one of the better elements of the film. Yeah, um, I guess I'll give a short overview of what I thought about it. Um, overall, it was. Um, <clears throat> pretty enjoyable um i wouldn't say it like blew my head off or anything um it's another one of these uh movies that come out lately is it's long it's two and a half hours again and it did kind of feel like two and a half hours i agree it was too long i can't explain why but it felt a little bit meandery to me um i know towers and i discussed it and he didn't think that he thought the plot elements were pretty yeah. strong and they, they linked up but i don't know maybe it's how i was absorbing it um that being said um you know I don't think there was any bad characters or particularly bad elements to it. Um, and overall, it was pretty enjoyable. Maybe the stakes felt slightly um, not what I was expecting for a third movie. Um, and it also felt somewhat disjointed from Marvel um, overall and from the previous films. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Some people uh, don't like how joined up all the Marvel stuff is. Um, well, but I that's, that's just how thing. I interpreted it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, overall, um, pretty enjoyable, uh, but didn't blow my head off, I guess. Yeah, I mean, but I'm more or less uh, very much enjoyed the film. I thought it was really, really good. Um, very emotional, I think. Mm. With a lovely uh, engine that driving past outside. It's just you just agree with me that a film's very emotional. That's all the <laughs> young is doing, and yeah, no, it is, it is. It's a very, very emotional film, Adrian. Thank you. So, yeah, it's a very emotional film with the backstory of Rocket's character, and I kind of loved the fact that they chose Rocket as the, uh, the fo- focal point because we've had a lot of uh, Star Lords back character, and. It's a nice change of pace to actually choose one of the um, small, one of the, I suppose, small, smaller characters. Uh, yeah, get what you did there. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't an intentional, wasn't an intentional pun, but you're right. I get it now. It wasn't actually intentional. But what I would say, what I would say is, there were, were a few surprises to me in terms of I didn't expect. Um, Trying to go into too many surprises. Going to the film, I didn't really know what to expect, and I was expecting a bit more screen time from certain performers. Uh, for instance, Adam Warlock. I thought he would have more screen time than he did. Uh, I did like mistakes myself. The kind of mistakes that I liked, I thought the reasons behind why the characters do some do things, or the villains, um, why the villains doing what he's doing. I like those justifications of those reasons. Uh, I did think the villain was a little, little bit melodramatic, but I did also think it was fitting with his character, so I was, I was able to uh, forgive that. And overall, I had a fantastic time with the film. So, a lot of people have actually been stating how with the Guardians movies, these seem, whereas other Marvel films, you 
they say you need to have seen every other Marvel movie to understand it. With the Guardians movies, a lot of people, a lot of people coming up to this film literally watched one, two, Infinity War, Endgame, and then straight into this, and they pretty much got everything to understand the Guardians. And that's kind of interesting concept of how James Gunn approached these sets of films. Like these are almost contained with their own bubble to yeah. a degree, and not because they can travel through bubble lanes to actually like understand the movie. But yeah, for me, um, yeah, obviously this is this is a lot of people say this is Rocket's movie, but a lot of people said this is this is Star Lord's movie as well. Like it's 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 almost like fifty fifty in regards to those two characters. Obviously, you know, uh, with uh, Rocket Raccoon, he. His character was such an interesting choice because obviously when the first movies first came out, people went, you're doing a movie with a raccoon and a talking tree. How the how the fuck is this going to work? Uh, and then obviously James Gunn blew out the water in actually giving these characters. Going into Infinity War and Endgame specifically, Rocket actually had more of a presence because obviously he was remaining after the, the blip essentially. So he had more of a drive with his character. Um, with the actual like emotional stakes of this movie, this movie is a lot darker like then like a lot of people say you might not want to take small kids to see this film because it's quite like there are a couple of points where it gets quite dark that small kids James just uh, was saying before we were recording his and his showing someone walked out with uh, their kid yep absolutely but within the first hour of the film there was a certain point where um, yeah the kid walked I mean, there's a visual scene. We will get into spoilers. There's a visual scene towards the end of this film that's definitely like did not expect. For, oh god, um, yeah. Actually, there's a couple of points where I, I, I'm I'm a bit squeamish. I had to hide behind my hands a couple of times. I was like, oh, I can't watch yeah. that. And uh, also, this movie is the first time they say fuck in a Marvel film, <laughs> which was, it, it was brilliant. F bomb. Yeah, it was perfect. so good. Is that fact checked? Yes, like, it's first fact. Absolutely, been, shit's been said. I believe shit's been said. Everything, but fuck is the first time. Like, <laughs> to be fair, that that interaction was one of the funniest moments. Oh my in the film god, for me, so, was yeah. when, when... an official uh, fuck check from uh, Nate. Y- yeah. Yes, an official fuck check from Nate. Yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let's coin that term. Yeah, like, yep. the there best part about fuck it check. was the weird context of, of it was like if I can get into that part of the film. But the, obviously, Peter Quill would would have been exposed to cars up until his mother dies and he gets abducted right from the first film so but he, but even as his kid knowledge of how a car works and the car handle and i think it's nebula trying to get in the yeah, car nebula, right yeah. and then he just gets fed up trying to explain how the button on a classical like style car door worked to open the latch and then just loses his rag and just goes, just get in the fucking car. It's just really good. <laughs> but yeah, so um, obviously, you know, but I, I actually think this is one of the best Marvel films in many years, to be honest. Like, you know, I loved No Way Home, but I think No Way Home played into the nostalgia. The nostalgia factor was actually kind of perfect for No Way Home, which actually played on my heartstrings a bit. And also... Not it was, seen it. it. Honestly, I still recommend it. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Out of the, out of the phase three... Move so out of the phase four movies we've had, No Way Home. I did really enjoy Shang Chi. To be fair, it did taper off at a bit at the end to me in the third act. But um, I think this is definitely like I know we're in phase five now. But they say this is the best film since Endgame. It probably is like within those two films. But also, a lot of people are ranking this within their top five Marvel films Guardians. ever. Yeah, Guardians, Guardians three. three. Right? Yeah, yeah, like interesting because obviously a lot of people love Guardians ones because it was it was so left field for what it did. Like. We had the bog standard Marvel formula, and then James Gunn came in and went, hello there, like changing the formula completely. But with this movie, and also knowing this is his last movie, he just went all out. And obviously with knowing the actors as well. And we'll get into the characters now, we'll get into the actors and everything. But So I'm going to start off here. Um, uh, Chukwadi Iwaji as the High Evolutionary. Um, a lot of people have stated this guy is, firstly, he was in uh, Peacemaker, the TV show which is this the spin-off for Suicide Squad. as And then basically during that, he actually filmed his Marvel edition using DC as the filming resource to get this Marvel role, which I think is a nice connection there. Okay. But his performance was brilliant, in my opinion. Well, I mean, I, I can't really talk about how I feel about it without getting into spoilers yeah. part of the discussion. But yeah, no, I, I really liked as a big bad, right, in show. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the whole the big good defeats the big bad always at the end of the story but like how it traditionally happens with Marvel films but as far as like an interesting big bad like I've never seen the big bad like behave this kind of way the 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 deliverance of like some of the lines and it's almost like the mad science the mad scientist yeah. but 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 I'm talking mad not as in crazy mad as in angry so it's 
the delivery was was phenomenal. I loved it. All I've got to say about it is that yeah, he was intense. Like it yeah. was unhinged. Every scene he was in was intense. Mm. It was either it was either ten percent or a hundred and ten percent. It was crazy. I'm probably thinking more towards the end of the movie, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, a good villain. Wasn't quite expecting something like that out of Guardians Three, but yeah, it was. Uh, it yeah. was. Fun. Performance performance was very melodramatic at times, but it did fit the character. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, I, I yeah, did like it. I feel like his motivations were pretty clear. Once you again, to spoil a bit, once you understood some of the past that he had with Rocket. Yeah, and also like uh, he has stated that he did study a lot of Shakespeare for this performance, which you, you can definitely tell he, yes. he is very thespian in how his approach went. And I definitely agree with you, Taz, in regards to his literally shifting into he he, he has no like build up between his like switches and that's the scary part of his character and like you don't know which face you're going to get essentially like yeah. the calm face of the keeps you on edge get the as, fucking as, out as of their face bad, yeah. yeah keeps you on edge but yeah, again I think that makes sense again considering his past and the Shakespearean element as well um as you said, what you say, you say he should studied a lot of Shakespeare he he, he did Shakespeare and, study for this movie yeah um I I don't know Chuck Waddy's um history but does did he do a lot of stage work because uh, it, it kind of feels like when you're on stage you you have to throw your voice a lot yes so it's it's i feel like i recognize him from something else i mean he i mean again he was in uh oh, john he, wick uh Is he it? was in, was he was in john wick Apparently. yeah he was in john wick trying to chat to you as like a coney i don't remember but i recognize his face yeah but uh yeah he's he was in he was in king Lear. Uh, he was in, um, you know, he's been in a few different things, not a lot of major things, but, um, yeah, it's, it's really nice to see him. Like I, there's a few theories that I'm going to get into in the spoilers section for his character specifically that, um, cause I think there is a way for this character to be around for a long time, but, uh, we'll get into the end of the spoiler section. So, um, so obviously getting to the other characters, you know, we spoke briefly about, um, Zoe Saldana as Gamora, uh, before, um, we didn't really speak about Nebula that much. I think like she had a great performance in this movie as well. She actually felt like um, quite a different character to me, or more like she had evolved as a character over the time between the films. Because Nebula felt kind of like one or two note before. She was just sort of pissed off and a badass. And you kind of see some other sides of her where she's integrated into the, the city a little bit more and like shows a bit more of a caring, like integrated side into the group. Her arm as well. This maybe the 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 uh, the plot armor arm essentially as I'm, I'm going to call it the the Deus Machina arm <laughs> uh, that could do anything. Which I'm not going to lie, I guess it didn't do a ton of stuff, but for what it could do, it had every re- you know had had an answer for a lot of stuff in the film. I'm surprised we didn't see more of her wings as well that she had at the start. Uh, that was pretty cool. I mean, I think there's a specific reason why we didn't see her wings later on. To be honest, um, to be an I thought I thought she gave a great performance. I'm I'm there's a she. I know she's advocating to try and become Poison Ivy in the uh, DC universe now. I'd be uh, definitely interested. Obviously, natural redhead as well. So, I'd be definitely interested in that. I didn't know that. I, I think I've only seen her as uh, as Nebula. So, um. <laughs> well, she did shave her head for the first film. Yeah, she did say that because she actually came on stage at Comic Con and took her wig off to reveal that she shaved Oof. her head for the film. But then, for I believe for subsequent films, she just cut her hair and like you know did that and everything. Uh, so obviously, do you have, do you have any notes on Nebula at all, James? Yeah, it was fine. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really have anything massively amazing or massively negative to say. It was, it was, it was, it was fine. I mean, have you guys seen the holiday uh, special? Yes. I have, yes. Yeah, I watched it on Christmas Day. Because I think like she in that film in that short film, we got to see the transitional phase between her original version and the version she is now. And I do love how, you know, there is in the trailers, they play off the fact that Nebula is more like Gamora and then the whole, like, why does she just get with Star-Lord in the end situation? Yeah, that was awkward. I feel like that was a bit token. Mm. That that really went over my head. I, I just, I wasn't a big fan. That's fair. That's fair indeed. So obviously, you it know, again... A, as a joke, yeah. Sure, oh, yeah. But like, yeah. apart from that, it was just... Ugh. I mean, obviously, we spoke about Dave Bautista briefly. Obviously, you know, Dave Bautista has stated this is his last portrayal as Drax the Destroyer. Uh, and we've spoke about it in like previous podcasts and how out of all the wrestling actors, Dave Bautista is the, the, the highest in, in regard to acting, in my in my opinion, because... He's the best, best of those actors. Yeah, so exactly. Like, he literally, he stated... Although maybe, may, 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 maybe not quite as good as Hulk Hogan, maybe. Oh, let's not. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's... Oh, let's not talk about him. 
so obviously, you know, Dave Bautista has come out and stated he wants to be an actor, not a movie star. And I think with his, re- you know, with his recent works in this movie, he, he shows more, you know, Drax in the, in the first Guardians movie, he is shown as like a very, he doesn't understand like puns, he doesn't understand this. He's very f- solid focused in one regard. But as the movies went on, he became the comedic effect. He became dumber, or he was portrayed as dumber. But this movie like sort of like t- flips on its head to a degree. We went into the spoiler section, but it really shows his character has much added layers to him and much depth and, it shows he's not, he's not, you know, there's a reason why he was shown that way for previous movies, possibly, to show how he is in this movie for his conclusion, essentially. I, th- I think it's really nice because they, they continue to develop his character, which I imagine this is something that he probably on his side, on Dave's side, has been pushing for. Like, and I get, I totally get, I think it's a huge fear for, for a lot of actors. Um, Like, I'm not, I'm not skilled in the biz, so people are welcome to call me out, but. I think it's a big fear in the biz that I hear about is that people don't want to get typecast into certain mm. roles. They don't want to be known as, oh, the guy that plays the idiot or the guy that plays X. I'm not saying that's about Drax, but it's really nice to see an, a natural development and end to to Drax's character. Depending on how, you know, you know how Marvel and Disney magic, the, the character could be recast. I hope not, personally. I never like recasts, but... Um, Dave is a fantastic actor. Um, his performance, I cannot, I could not give you his character name, but his performance in Blade Runner was um, phenomenal. And it was, very, it was very a very short role. It was fantastic. It was a very short role, but it really, it really set the the threat. But his 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 impact on that film resounds through the rest of the film because you see he's he's actually kind of like the prophesizing character of the rest of the plot of the film because he turns around and he's like, oh, you know, you hunt your own and or. Um, you don't know what you're kind of like the prophesizing warning you don't know what you're dealing with here and then slowly um, um, the oh gosh the actor's name the main character oh Ryan Gosling yes character. yes that's yeah. it Ryan Gosling sorry I, I had a brain failure then but yeah Ryan's character over the film then fulfills out Dave Batista's character's prophecy but I really want to catch Dave's work with um, what's the horror film in the house oh uh, Knock at the Door Knock at the Door apparently that is really good I have heard that they, um, specifically for the film... Knock at the Cabin, right? Knock at the Cabin, yeah. Because obviously we had Cabin in the Woods and a Knock at the Cabin. Maybe get maybe get a third Cabin film in the future. Um, so I know um, M. Night Shyamalan, who obviously has been in a very, let's say, a lull with his films in recent years. Um, a lot of people have stated how that film is actually better. He actually went to the writer of the original book and actually said, can I change the ending of this film? Because I feel it flows better this way. And I believe the writer came out and said that was actually possibly his original intention for that specific way anyway. So the ending of the movie does actually lean more towards the writer's original aim. And supposedly Dave Bautista does give a brilliant performance in that role because it's more of a, um, it's more of a calm performance to his other. And I will say going on to your point of typecasting and everything like that, because obviously we're seeing it recent years with, again, Pedro Pascal is becoming the person who protects young children and everything with The Last of Us and Mandalorian and everything. It's been seen as that. But also actors like uh, Dwayne Johnson, who every film he's in now is pretty much just the same character, even in when he plays a superhero or when he's not meant to play a yeah, superhero. To be fair, any film, is. any film with Dwayne Johnson in it is, is just, hi, it's Dwayne Johnson in X. <laughs> in, Whereas, in X or in Y or Z. Even John Cena, like, you know, I know he, he's very good at comedic roles, which we know for, he's also very good in action roles, but he does at least attempt to change it, you know, with the Suicide Squad, he did attempt to change how he was there. Whereas in other movies, such as Blockers, which is a very fucked up comedy movie, but he does attempt to change different. But with Batista... He goes into every role aiming to be completely different to how he was before. And I know a lot of people are advocating, especially myself included, that he should be playing Kratos in the God of War TV show. Because I think he's the perfect age for it. I think he gives the dramatic performance. He's got the build for it. And I think uh, he'd be perfect in the role of Kratos because they're doing yeah. the Norse spe- specific cool. version of Kratos. If we can't get Christopher Judge to do it. <laughs> yeah, no. A lot of people want Triple H and I'm like, no, I don't know. I've, I've, <laughs> seen, I've seen, I've seen um, that uh, Babysitter movie, like, no, um, or whatever role he was in. But yeah, um, back to uh, Drax, though. We, we tangent it a little bit there. Um, I, I think he's one of the characters, I think a lot of the main Guardians cast get expanded in this film in terms of what you see of them what character elements and i think that drax is is one of them 
the, uh, you get to see a lot more sides of him, which yeah, it was uh, it was nice to see. He definitely ha- he does have a specific key role in this movie as well, which we'll get into the spoiler discussion section. Which plays out really well. Uh, uh, Pom uh, Clementif as Mantis. I thought you know obviously as we know from the holiday special, she is now Peter's sister. Uh, which is um, in canon. Um, I think she gives a great performance as well. Like, I love the brother sister effect of her and Drax between each other. You could definitely feel the love between those characters and the the major frustrations, especially that they play off each other. And I love the fact that the holiday special that they state James stated he wanted to focus on those two characters because they were sort of like they didn't have enough screen time essentially. So going into this movie, I think seeing the holiday special, you can sort of see that evolution of the and the relationship between those two characters and her arc in this movie as well, I think by the end it gives a it gives great direction for her character and how it's portrayed in the movie. And I think uh Palm Clementine gives a great performance. And I know a lot of people are advocating for her possibly being the new Lois Lane in the DCU as well. So that'd be a bit interesting if that character mm. carried over there. So, so I would say um, I actually really like Mantis as a character. I think she's she treads a good line between like funny and, you know, s- super sincere and kind of like, I guess, brings part of the heart to the group. Um, and uh, she has that role in here, that emotional kind of role, but also we get to see a little bit more of her combat abilities and her unique um, characteristics, how she can bring that to combat, which I thought was really fun. Like the bit where she's making, you know, they're in the middle of a firefight. She makes a guy start dancing. Yeah. There's another part where like she, she grabs someone else and makes like that person super mad. So that person just berserking and shooting guns everywhere, killing their own. It's, it's just good. It's a, it's a good performance. There's it's one fun to watch. thing she does specifically with one character. We'll get into the spoiler section. I thought it was quite hilarious to be honest. It involves Drax. So, um, and any any thoughts on our Mantis, James? No, but I was going to talk, I was going to talk about what you just mentioned there in the spoiler section as well. So we'll come come to it then. But I just want to say, uh, in terms of side characters that that little section involved, I thought that's I thought that actor was really really good. The little little cameo role. Yeah, no, definitely agree. Um, um, I will I've say got, I've got a thought about Mantis. Okay. Um, when, if we're talking character flaws, I've, I've thought about something with Mantis. It's like her her key power is manipulating people, essentially, yes. or, or changing their mind, but manipulating people's minds. Um, and she, she has almost little consequence to this. But I noticed uh, something when, when she sends Drax to speak to Quill. So when she doesn't have the stones to essentially manipulate people directly with her powers... It seems like she's using other people she knows to to further her interest because obviously she she wants Quill to get over. She get basically over wants to, she wants to in help that scene right. She wants to well, got not against too much spoilers, but specifically. Oh, sorry. She, no, 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 no. We we can we can dance right, but um, she's basically trying. She Quill doesn't essentially take her words always. You know, she because she's always yeah. emoting, she's always pushing for ideas, but coming from Drax, someone completely different. Uh, she wants to essentially help heal Quill emotionally and because she doesn't want to do it directly she uses someone else and then there's a funny scene in regards to how that plays out specifically but I, for her. I feel like I feel like that is a bit of a character flaw that, that she's either socio manipulating people like I'm not saying it's malicious right but but she is doing this so I, I, does this ever resolve in I the mean, film does I, she ever like realize that that she can't just go around either directly or. I think that's actually like more... I appreciate manipulating people to get in out of a situation, like you know, causing combat and things like that. Like that is funny, great to see on screen. But like, if we're just talking character development, like I think that's a bit of a serious character flaw. So I think it's actually um, so it's it's a character flaw in regards to her personality, but also I think it because as I said before, she she's always trying to um, help everyone. She's trying to assist everyone. Her literal role with ego was to you know, assist him as much as she could, you know, like make him sleep and everything. Like that was her literal role. So she's always trying to help everyone, but sometimes possibly it becomes too overbearing to a degree when she tries to do that. So that's why she tries to have other characters do it for her. Now there are narrative drop beats, which I, towards the end of the film, we could discuss specifically for her. And I think that plays into specifically what you're talking about and how that manipulation and like, workings for her play out yeah because my memory is, is is patchy on whether there was any kind of development on that floor because it'd be it'd be great to see like for example if it was written in that she kind of realized that she doesn't always have to manipulate people to to let things play out sometimes she she doesn't have to intervene right because it kind of feels like 
when she feels some when her character feels something she has to intervene right yeah agreed so obviously you know we we spoke a good part about um rocket raccoon i i will say you know with this movie you know being in a mo- it's pretty much his, it, if you take the balance of characters in this movie it's pretty much his movie in star lords but it does lean more towards more rocket in this movie for specific the problem with this with this film we can't really discuss the reasons and the drive behind rocket's performance and the rocket's narrative unless we go into the spoiler section but i can say that you know again this is a very dark film and it, this does go into like animal cruelty cruelty and like you know a test you know testing on animals as well which is a big political statement in the world today um and also just like you know a lot of people forget that bradley cooper's performance in this and you know going from the hangover to playing rocket raccoon okay just voicing character but he does he brings such emotional depth to the role and obviously we see um the reason why he acts this way in in all these movies we see how he acts this way how he why he's so intelligent which actually has has a key play role in the movie not going too much into it um and obviously we get like performances from other characters who have actually had other marvel roles as well but we'll get to that specifically in the spoiler section um we can't really talk about you know the guardians without talking about Groot obviously you know we can't say vocal portrayal because it's literally, you know, very few words are spoken. But obviously, I do love the fact that Vin Diesel, it's known that he does actually dub all the voices himself in all the different languages. So it's always it's consistently his voice in those languages as well. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a great thing. And obviously, it's not really difficult for him it's, to... It's a good effort that not many people will know about behind the screen. So yeah, definitely. It's a cool thing. It's probably because he cares... A, in, in a weird way, because I've seen some of the some of the ways Vin Diesel talks about the character, and he says it's been really awakening to perform that character, even though he does go into a studio and just says "I'm Groot" about three different ways. <laughs> but that, like, I I can I can understand how 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 it it would ground a person. I mean, Vin has always been a guy, an actor. I followed Vin for quite a while, and he always seems like um he's very much about family is very much about yeah. yes i know, yeah. that, no, that, yeah. like, no, i'm not even referencing the meme here like like he he he's always been about family and caring and compassion he, he seems like a he seems like a really genuine guy to meet like not saying everyone else is trash and a massive nerd but, yeah as well right because what he played D as well like he played well he has a movie blood sport is literally based off of his D and D character, and oh, he, yeah. he's played it with the critical role exactly. people. He did a D and D session as well, so yeah. yeah. But yeah, I can see how presenting an interesting character challenge, especially for this arc, is Vin also leaving Guardians, or is it's not he always down? It's 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 we yeah. we don't basically the only people stated so far. So Jen, so Peter Quill, um, so Star Lord has come out and said he would possibly work after James Gunn's departure, depending on how narratives go. Uh, Zoe Saldana has said she'd love for someone to take over the role. And also, fun fact, she's the only actress really in free, like, tr- you know, tr- uh, but billion dollar movies, or tr- multiple billion, Avatar um, and the Avengers movies. She's the only actress that actually crosses over I can really see that. why in Zoe's case. Um, like, Zoe Zoe is doing her best with the character. For some reason, it didn't identify with me as much. It's it's a difficult thing to identify with a character that has has died and has come back, but from almost like a whole bunch of time in the film lore has reset, has gone. So it's kind of like we're you're taking a, original Guardians one um, Gamora and bringing that character back in and then injecting it into a lot of other contexts with a lot of other people and i can't I, I yes i do i did like the you know i love her but she doesn't love me back dynamic um that was going on but at the same time it was it felt way too cold to me yeah, well, and it was strange and not just that like zoe betrays her own character i think at one point no sorry not zoe herself obviously zoe's just portraying gamora, the character yeah. but gamora gamora's actions betray betrayed her own what i think gamora is even before the amne- amnesia stuff well it's not amnesia it's before she came resurrection right before she came back um, because of the whole when she calls, I don't think this is spoilers because if I just say it without context, but when she calls the Ravagers. Yes. So when she calls the Ravagers off the ship, like it, it was kind of like, it was like she just trusted who was on the other side of the line immediately. Yes. Right? Yes. That... And, and I thought Gamora would be way more smarter than that. Yeah, we, we can character. get into that a bit later. But yeah, that was a 
that was a bit of a not a plot hole, but I was like, really, you fell for that? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was a bit where the plot kind of fell for me in yeah. terms of Kimura's character. Like, going back to Groot, um, just briefly, uh, he's probably one of the characters that didn't develop as much, uh, mostly probably because of the nature of the character. But I will say the kaiju form that he did. That was really cool. I like yeah. that as like an intimidation yeah. technique. I was, I, w- I was about to say there were actually points in the film where he grew quite a lot as a character. But uh, so, you yeah. and I have. You're not wrong. Yeah. You're not wrong, man. Yeah, you win that. You win that. Have a guy, James. You it, definitely win that. It indeed. does really feel like Groot's kind of. Um, what's the? I, I I can never remember the name for these things, but it's the character that they, you just you can just throw at the problem, and and it fixes the issue. It's it's kind of like the the the, oh, the Mary Sue. The, in a way, six, no, because Mary no, Sue is just a, like a perfect a character yeah. with no flaws whatsoever. Yeah, true, yeah. But like Groot does have flaws. You can only say I am Groot, etc. And he's a little bit just throw, slow throw Groot in the terms problem. of picking yeah. up a lot of things. Well, he's the brawler, yeah, it, right? A lot of situations, it does just feel like throw Groot at the problem. One other thing I've noticed as well is that because he's, he's been regrowing for like three three movies, right? Well, I can say that this is actually a different Groot. I was gonna say because he looks way different than the Groot in Guardians One. Yeah, so um, this is this is not the same Groot from Guardians One. That one did die in Guardians oh, One. Oh, okay. So and obviously this is a new version. Essentially, you know, Makes sense. Re- it's a re- it's a rebirth. Essentially, mm. like growing mm. and everything. And I couldn't tell watch watching this film in the context <clears throat> I have of not watching a lot of Marvel films, and but I did watch because um, Groot does disappear on screen yes in, yeah. in, in the big the Avengers Infinity thing, right? War yeah. Infinity War that's the one <laughs> see I, I, that's proof I don't know many of the films because I can't remember which goddamn film it's from but yeah I didn't even I completely forgot that fact going into it, Guardians it, 3 I just didn't even remember that Groot had gone if you look at them side by side the original and the, the version that's in Guardians 3 they, they're pretty different so getting on to this actually this is actually a nice segue with Groot specifically but um obviously as we know in the in recent years Disney well you know in recent years Marvel movies the VFX have sort of dropped and there's been a whole discussion about this in the industry this movie on goddamn point yep. all the way through it looked stunning you can like, tell there was a budget behind it like clearly like they were given the resources to put together some really stunning visuals and some really good practical makeup as well. Yes, no, like because when I watched the holiday special with Gru, because obviously we see him in his like his um, rugby American football form, as I like to say, uh, I thought that was almost a suit at the beginning when I first looked at it because it looked you could generally put a person in that suit. I'm not going to lie, and you could easily put a Gru- Groot's Groot's form in this movie. You could easily have put a person and CGI'd the blue away from the suit and everything. I think that could have easily been done. Did Vin ever do like practical? Suit I work? think there was motion capture work in the first movie. I think there was there, and I know there's a funny video of Jane, them using James Gunn's dancing for the start of Guardians Two when he's dancing around and everything. So that's actually James's exact dance moves. But I don't know about free. I think it's a different actor for free. But you could have easily like had someone in a suit for this on film. set group there you go yeah on, I'm re- yeah i'm really washed out on vis- visual effects from marvel films i'm afraid not to sorry to be the counterpoint to to it they look great but it's kind of one of those things where we've had so many marvel epics i'm just used to it it's it's nice in the context of the guardians because the guardians feels like way more of a space age type sci-fi so i think that's where it marries up with with what i like so you get you get a lot more license to use a lot more effects it's not the shield breaking one for example on the on the ship but what i really liked as well a bit of a cinematography aside which i do see a bit rare was um the practical side of things because as uh, quill was putting some kind of um they were having a conversation at the same time but then over the radio at the same time nebula was calling out shields and then um Peter was, oh, was yes. putting devices into physical machines within the ship. Then it was translating to the visual effects on screen of the ship bre- breaching through each individual shield. I actually thought as a back and forth whilst also explaining, also moving the plot ahead. I think that was a really nice like like way to, instead of just having the visual effect happen and then go, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're doing this to move the shields out of the way. It was also a nice way of the, ca- the characters physically aiding in bringing the effect to the screen so I think this I, is I, why, from a um, cinematography standpoint I like that uh, not just the cinematography I think like just like the entire visual aesthetic like you know those the prison guard outfits which are fucking weird as hell um, that whole section had so many weird just tone the line of uh, absurd visuals but it was pretty yeah I think it they were fun to look at uh, but no I, yeah just I just generally think this film like 
with how James has left this franchise, I know a lot of people are sad that he's left because he's he's he has gone on and it's very rare for someone to go on a high note on a third film like you don't you don't get it very often like you know some people say the second film wasn't as good as the first one which i say that but yeah. a lot of people actually stated though because did you rewatch the second one recently at all i haven't no so a lot of people said if you go back and rewatch the second one it actually holds up a lot better than people first realized i can say obviously you know in the second film it's revealed that star is half celestial type being i kind of would have liked that to have played into everything going forward because even if he wasn't like you know um you know he didn't have the massive powers of ego it's stated in the first film that's the reason why he could hold the power stone was because he was not all human it's all but forgotten but i think this film sort of like shows that quill is sort of like he's had to lean more of his humanity now he's having to figure out who he is at this point uh so i think um obviously the music score i think we can we don't really have to say much about it but the music score was always it's always on point in guns projects to be honest i know a lot of people have said that um <clears throat> going forward in the franchise if someone does a guardians force you know a new version of the guardians because there's in the comic books there are different teams of guardians of the galaxy so in the original version i think star lord was there but a lot of the other characters weren't rocket was as well i believe um, a lot of people have actually, myself included, come up with the idea. A lot of people, I actually think it was me. Going forward, Edgar Wright would be a good person to bring on to take over the franchise. I'd like to see that, yeah. But because, mostly because I just really like his films. <laughs> well, also because but, he was supposed to do Ant Man, but okay. he dropped off because yeah. there was a bit of like creative clash there. But He'd be looking, a good fit, possibly, yeah. But he, he, he is, like James Gunn, he is someone who uses music. Yes. well in his movies and yes. i think if they try to because i think with the guardians movies now they could really shift the the style of the guardians movies going forward but i think music is so enrooted in that in that in that you know movie franchise for these i think going forward it would be it would be safe bet to keep that style to you, a degree you know what i i hadn't even thought about that but you're totally right and i just thought about baby driver and how well he uses music in that film um and yeah Probably not to the as direct degree that it does in Baby Driver, but that kind of style, yeah, I agree that could work really well. Baby Driver as well is one of my my absolute favorite films, like Bell Bottoms as well in the opening scene too. Yeah, like is it the opening scene for Bell Yes, Bottoms? it is. Yeah, 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 it's phenomenal. Like when those those guitar hits hit and it's like dun dun dun, and it's it's yeah, it's nowhere it's to go. So good. No nowhere to run to. Nowhere baby, to the run. End of now, yeah, baby. But uh, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say um. I'm really excited about that prospect. I hope that's not just a thing that you've made up and never happens because that would be cool. No, I, I, I was generally thinking the other day, I was thinking like in regards to directors going forward, I think with Edgar Wright having like, he didn't leave in a bad sense. It was just creative differences. He couldn't work out the entire entire in. I think like it's been a good almost 10, about 10 years since Ant-Man and everything. And I think bringing him back into it would be a nice approach to be honest. I think... He would actually be a brilliant director to bin in. Because also, Edgar Wright has shown he can do multiple different franchises, horror, comedy, driving. He recently did the um, the sort of like 1960s horror aesthetic film. I can't remember the name of it, unfortunately. Uh, but he show, he's shown great range. And I think he, he also has a passion for character and he has a passion for the actors behind the character as well. Same as James Gunn with the actors they have. And I think that's needed for such a close-knit family of performances uh, did you have any comments james no i was just going to concur that i thought your idea of edgar wright is uh, really good yeah. yeah one character actually we literally didn't mention which i really feel bad for um adam warlock yeah i thought i mean i, I mean i thought i was expecting to have for him to have much bigger presence in the film than he did i thought the initial uh scenes with with his character was a really good setup, but it didn't go as much. Um, the character didn't do as much after that point as I expected him to do. I think it was a perfect comedic duo because he he was the the slapstick, the 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 dumb one essentially. I really love that his character was played out as dumb. And then um, who was the um, the the duo? Because it was the duo. His mother, was his mother right? Yeah. Who was yeah. his mother? Uh, she, so she um, was in the second movie. She was the uh, sovereign. Uh, society. I'm just trying to bring up her name now. There are a lot of people in this yeah, movie. There's, a, there's oh, a lot of crap. people in this movie. Like it's, it's quite. I know. I know her name's Elizabeth. I know that for sure. Right. But unfortunately, I can't. Um. You know, I can't find her name at the moment. But I know she. Yeah. She. She was the. She was the main. But she one of the was main the straight man of the 
in quotation marks, I mean straight man. I know it's a gendered term, but in in the comedic duo, she was the straight man of of the duo. Aisha, her name is. Yeah. Oh right, nice. Yeah, well, I just wanted to search that up quickly that specifically. A, and the fact that they, they they I think they had it was a nice side story running across mm. the whole thing that that I mean it's the classic thing is like of like the big bad essentially tasks them two as renegades and they have to play against both sides to get there first to try and mm. slight the spoilers but to try and get rocket back, right? Yeah. So so obviously you know i didn't realize how many actors were actually in this film just scrolling for this and a lot of people like a lot of big actors taken on very minuscule mm. roles to be honest which is um also some of these names are great there was like a guy called blurp yeah murph <laughs> but also just lamb shank <laughs> just to bring it back though i 100 percent agree with everything you're saying uh Taz, but i i just wish there was more i just wish we had a bit more screen time and we're able to develop some of that a bit more I, I know what you mean um i i do agree but honestly it feels like they've kind of planted some seeds for perhaps further um work further appearances of that character basically so you're saying james that you would have preferred a three-hour screen time or more <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, half in. an hour more hey, put there, all him. there have been some yeah. great three-hour films in the last couple of years for batman and john wick 4 i don't so, uh, sit that long anymore my my blood is not is starting to not become very friendly well, actually, <laughs> with, with long need, films. We need to bring back intervals. We need to bring back intervals. Yeah, you know yeah. what? If we're gonna have regularly have three hour movies, I wouldn't mind a little interval. As uh, James has stated, proudly stated, he was the only person in the Batman movie who didn't leave the uh, cinema to go to the bathroom. I just want to point out: go to IMDb people, IMDb people, and search the actor Jonathan Mercedes. He is literally credited as Gomorra shoots this guy. I'm sorry, but that is a that is a great casting like name in my opinion. Like violent. Wait, where do I know Jonathan? Orgo Sentry, human, human animal rabbit, Neely. Wow, some of these names, some of these character names. But um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're pretty much going to wrap it up there. Oh, actually, no, one character I didn't want to mention because they were introduced in the Holly Special as well, which you didn't really mention before we wrap up. Cosmo. Oh, I love Cosmo. And uh. Played by uh, Maria Balak- um, Maria Bakalova, obviously first yeah. came to recognition from the Borat subsequ- subsequent movie film, playing his daughter in that movie. I thought that this character was just going to be like a little like joke character, but it was quite nice to see like legitimately a talking dog in a spacesuit have relevance to the plot. That was cool. I mean, I- they are, and they've been in every film as well because ah. they were in the because fir- Cosmo, no, Cosmo was originally a male voice, I think, there at first, but. Um, they adjusted it for the movies going forward. They were in Guardians One in the Collector's um, yeah, Prism. Yeah, but it, it, it's just like a ten-second yeah. appearance, isn't it? So Things yeah, with the duck. that's what I'm saying. It yeah, and who is also in this movie, I believe. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just cool to see. Like I don't know, it's a silly, really silly character because it's a dog in a spacesuit, but it's Guardians, so it just works. It's, it was. Um, I, I like that we got more screen time with Cosmo and Craglin. I, I, I keep forgetting to mention Big House. They do have a good part. In that. I think Craglin doesn't have a, a huge amount to do in this film. He does have like good pl- pivotal plot points, but I think plays out. It does tie up some loose character ends with uh, him and uh, Yondu. But yeah. um, I think you know uh, Sean Gunn, obviously James Gunn's brother, plays that plays that role, and obviously he is the onset Rocket Raccoon as well for the motion capture. So he does a dual role in this film. I I love how James Gunn did James Gunn write as well, right? I believe he, yeah, he writes he writes all of his films as well, I believe, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, obviously, you know, um, going about the visual effects, the characters, everything, I've, yeah, I think like this movie, as we stated, great time, and I think it's a great um, end to this character run for a lot of these people performing. If we see them get some going forward, fight, leave out to the spoiler section to find out what we can talk about going forward, but now we're getting to the review, so we're getting to the uh, review roundup and also ratings, so as we've done the review roundup at the beginning, pretty much. I'm gonna give this a nine out of ten. I think this is I think this is up there as one of the best Marvel films I've seen in recent years. I can't wait to see it again. I'm probably gonna wait till it's out on Disney Plus because I think it's the usual forty five day run now before it's on Disney Plus. Um, because because also there's so many films coming out with across the Spider Verse, Flash coming out soon as well. Um, but I'm I cannot wait to see this again, and I can't wait to see where the Guardians franchise goes in the future. Also, big shout out actually quickly. Go play the Guardians of the Galaxy video game. He's always on, saying this to which us. Which is on Xbox Game Pass. There's a reason why a lot of the uh, a lot of the narrative elements in this movie tie into that game specifically, and there's also different interpretations 
in that game, which I think work out really well. It's on Game Pass, people go check it out. But again, I give this a 9 out of 10. Uh, yeah, like I said, overall, I, I did enjoy it a lot. Um, I wouldn't say it's one of my favourite films in the Marvel collection, but it's pretty good. Um, I'm interested to see where they take the franchise in future, like that. Uh, Nate says we'll talk a little bit more more about that in spoilers, but yeah, I'd say oh, I'm struggling. Uh, uh, I'm I'm gonna go with eight. Okay, okay, eight out of ten. Can I can I not score it or is it gun to my head? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a James gun to your head. Yeah, yeah. Oh god. Okay. Um. Well, my score don't mean shit for my opinion, so I I'm gonna give it a good seven and a half. Like, but that for me is good because I'm like really averted to like. If you tell me it's Marvel, I'm already on on edge of as to whether it's going to be good or not. But again, like I'm a big fan of Guardians. Uh, I'm a big fan of James Gunn. I was a huge fan of Slither, which he wrote and directed. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, um, back in the day, I was a massive fan of Slither. That was a fantastic movie. Fucked up movie. <laughs> um, I think it's great. I don't think James Gunn should continue in superhero movies. I think he should totally just branch out. He's fantastic at what he does. Like he he should he should he should move away from, you know, big big name like DC or Marvel. I I want to see it's it's more a good a positive thing for me. I want to see more of his original di- directorial stuff. Slither was fantastic. I loved Super. it. Sorry? Super. Yeah, but that's still in the kind of like superhero genre. Oh, even, yeah. Even, even yeah. though it's kind of like a piss take of it. Mm. Yeah. You know what? I was. That's what I was struggling with. I was like, do I give it a seven and a half or do I give it an eight? So don't feel bad about that score. Yeah. Um, but on the whole, um, it's about one of my favorite characters in the Guardians lineup that has been a great addition to the other films. So I was like, yeah, sure. It's fantastic. Um, the the whole double storyline element with. with um, with how Rocket's backstory was being shown on screen uh, in the flashback style, you know, and then also the the kind of race against time that was kind of put as the high stakes element. Without saying too much in that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and again, Chukwadi as as the big bad is, was, yeah, I, I, I really, I vibe with this a lot more than other Marvel films. Um but yeah, I, I agree with the sentiment. Don't don't necessarily take your small children to see it, but because I, um, of some of the more adult themes. But I think it's more of a fifteen. Well, that's the thing. I think it, it can get away with a twelve A for. I was getting to spoiler section specific reasons why it can. Uh, but in regards to how you said and vibing with it more specifically, I think it's how we spoke about at the beginning in regards to. It's almost like its own film bubble. Like, yeah. yes. but that's what I like about Guardians is because you 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 seem to be able to come back to that series whenever there's a new one, and and as me as not a tremendous Marvel fan, I don't need to have a friend in Marvel to explain to me forty different plot points to get it. The only thing I had to do to understand it was just understand that Gamora had had died and been brought back in a, in a past time. But that was one character, one element of the story, and it wasn't necessarily the important part of the plot, which was centered around Rocket, right? Which, yeah. So I, I love that that is a way more accessible thing for Marvel and the whole theme around it was really fun. Yeah, no, I, I, I really loved the film. I thought it was better than any of the other films in Phase... Any of the films that were in Phase 4 last year, it was better than all of those films. I think uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, it's got... it's. A film which has a lot of emotional heart to it, a lot of emotional re- resonance. I think the villain has great motivations. I think it's m- more interesting. Maybe a little bit uh, a tad too melodramatic at times, but again, it's, it's still a very, very understandable character. I very much enjoyed the story. I enjoyed the character development, how um, like Drax's character has, has changed a little bit over the films. And... Yeah, I'm going to give it an eight point five. So how do we round this? Out? I guess it. I guess it comes to about an eight, eight and a half. Then almost like I think it or eight eight. Yeah, so just... I give it a nine. You give it a eight. Around an eight, eight and a half. Yeah, yeah eight, eight, eight and a half out of ten for for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. So yeah, it's uh, it's nice to have you on for the first review section, uh, Towers. I hope you hope you enjoyed that. And now we're going to get into the spoiler yeah, it's okay. section. It's it's very tempting. To, it's really hard to talk about this film without spoilers. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, right. Uh, so now, people, right, uh, obviously, you know, we're now going to get into the spoiler section. Um, but obviously, we're going to take a mini break here at NMI. Um, but before we do that, uh, yes, yeah, so if you haven't seen the movie, please go away. 
Uh, go watch the movie. Come back for the spoiler section. <laughs> we'll go, just away. go away. Yeah, just go away. Well, just Actually, go away. If you off. haven't seen the movie, <laughs> go away. Why are you, you know, here, fuck off. Really? Go. You know, no, no. Please go enjoy go the movie off. and come no. back. And listen to the spoiler section. We're going to get into. But if you're leaving us now and you want to get in contact with us with any query, questions, queries, compliments, it's nmipodcastoutlook.com. That's nmipodcastoutlook.com. Uh, please go to our socials at nmicast. Follow us on there. Send us uh, your comments. What you thought about the movie. And if you please stick with us for the spoiler section after this small. Break and we'll and we'll, we'll give you a five four three two one round up for that. So yeah, see you in a minute, everyone. Bye bye. And welcome to the spoiler section, people. So obviously, you know, if you've not seen the film, please leave now. Uh, we are now going to be talking all the spoilers for the movie and the ending of the film and where the Guardians franchise could go in the future, possible iterations of the character going forward. So five, four, three, two, one. Um, yeah, the High Evolutionary, fucked up person, extremely fucked up. Especially his face at the end. Oh, gosh, yeah. Because I presume that's the point you were on about where you had yeah. to turn away. No, the bit I had to turn away from was where Rocket was uh, scratching his face. Um, oh, okay, oh, yes. Yeah. I actually thought that was really tame, the way it was shot. Uh, it, like, possibly. I probably turned away too too, uh, too soon on that. There's but... a few certain films you will not do too well with oh, if yeah. you turn away at a shot like that, which is actually tame. <laughs> so obviously, you know, getting into it, so obviously this film is generally about the animal cruelty and the, the animal testing on Rocket Raccoon and how, why he is so intelligent. And I'm thinking about it, I'd love going forward to show, it's shown how he is very ingenuitive and like he, he can make things out of pretty much nothing. But also I'd love going forward to show his intelligence much further, showing how he, because it's interesting, think back to Endgame, he was with Tony Stark when the whole Infinity Gauntlet was around and everything, and he was possibly working with Tony in regards to that, but we never really got to see anything like that. Yeah, he didn't really make any comments, did he, about that stuff? No, he yeah. just went, boom! Like, you yeah. know, he, you know, he, went, he went in the which was just hilarious. bringing it slightly back to the context of Volume 3, though, um, with the High Evolutionary, I really liked the dynamic at play. I, di- I didn't expect it... I don't go expecting much into Marvel movies. Sorry if this is a dead horse I keep beating when I talk on this podcast. But one thing that I was surprised to see was like the narrative vehicle of like um, made in my own image. Like kind of uh, he's he he essentially likens himself to a god. He wants to create the perfect universe. Essentially, that is played out. Like I get that. It's it's got a unique spin which I kind of like. Um, but the thing that I found really interesting was his his absolute intolerance to one of his own creations inventing something that he didn't foresee and then him not seeing it as a perfect creation. It was more of a test subject, a part of a batch. It was an imperfection, but then it had just enough uh, sentience, let's say, um, to be inventive, scientifically inventive. Because you see, um, he treats him almost like a son in a way, whilst whilst it's almost like in this testing stage when doing all the science and everything like that. But you can see that he's still, Rocket is still young and is still learning many other things, which is kind of strange in a way, because it's, it's almost like, it's almost like, um, like, like a savant level, but at the same time, not with street smarts. So you can kind of see how that has turned into as as Rocket obviously escaped and then developed all of his street smarts and why he's so street wise in his demeanor and behavior, but the big the big thing for me was when when the high evolutionary couldn't um, couldn't tolerate the that he did he'd fixed the formula he'd made it work, but even then, and 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 the best the best um, part of that was when the high evolutionary was like super duper just just super passive about destroying that entire uh, counter earth that he created because he's probably done this many times before but it was a really great way to tell the audience that the true thing that he couldn't tolerate was not that he hadn't yet created that was just a day in the life for him what really boils his blood was the fact that rocket exists mm. and and cuz it was kind of like one of those things where oh i need to just like let's dissect him figure out what what i did to create that element of rocket and then uh, and then just not attribute it to personality or individualism or anything like that a liberal idea right but just to say oh it must be something scientific that i did let's just dissect him and figure it out and obviously because it's 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 bothered him because it's implied but not told in the film that that he must have not been able to recreate what rocket had 
and that really bothers him as well that's why he sent people mercenaries to try and get rocket back and that's the kind of trigger point at the beginning of the main plot line when um when oh gosh warlock shows up when warlock shows up wrecks havoc in nowhere right i really liked that how that takes him from zero to a hundred when when he just cannot and 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 the fact that he laughs as well, thinking he's got one up on Rocket, when he's deciding, oh, you're not going to the, you're not going to enlightenment. I'm creating a perfect world. Oh, but don't worry, you're not going. You have this like special element, but you're not going. And when he like shows up almost drunk, right? Yeah. Like, and he's like, he because he's he can't tolerate. He's like, how did how does he have how did he get it working? You know what? I I hadn't actually. That had not occurred to me um, in terms of his background motivation because, you know, as I was saying in the non-spoiler bit, like clearly he's like really unhinged um, and just like an intense person. But I was attributing a lot of that because to the fact that Rocket had done that terrible injury to him, right? As well as the fact that obviously um, he was uh, one of the, his prized creations. But I hadn't thought about that driving element as well. But it makes sense because, yeah, like he obviously goes way beyond what is... Uh, a normal amount of um, dedication to retrieving one of his subjects and all of his staff think that too but clearly he's got all of this stuff going on that feeds the obsession with Rocket No, no, I agree, I think the motivation was really interesting for the character and I think it was um, So I um, I think with Rocket specifically, I love how he got his name I thought the fact that his name is such an emotional and I think that's what really drives the fact that the character is so he he's always like Sark. He's always you know he's always you know comments back and everything. It's that emotional wall that he puts up, and then finally realizing in this film that he literally had an entire family before that just got killed because of his actions as well. Like you know he 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 is the reason why he could have got them out. Like if he was a bit smarter about it, but he his emotions took over. And he he lost his rage, and that's how they ended up dead. Like if he, and I think that's why he tries to play it very like. Um, he, he tries to distance himself even from his family now still is because of the fact that his when he got too emotionally invested and he literally tried to save someone they all died and I've, i those those characters like you know that naming scene i thought was really emotionally driven and you know really it really encapsulated very well because i know um uh, i'm trying to get the character's name now unfortunately like i just need to remember it so basically we have four characters teeth's floor and Lila. So Lila is actually portrayed by Linda Cardellini, who actually is the wife of Hawkeye in the Marvel films. She's obviously been in previous James Gunn exploits such as Velma in the um, Scooby Doo movies. Uh, but I love I love her portrayal in the movie and how like you know she she seems like a like, almost like a um, doesn't seem like a romantic interest at first. She seems more like a you know a sisterly interest, you know trying to take care of him. But then towards the end, maybe see the emotional connection between those two characters and that scene where he is like in like a heaven version of like or whatever the afterlife version he is. But it's like you know the ca- all, the, all the cages are open, it's all white and they're all free and everything. And I do I like. I actually find feel kind of a bit worked up about that scene because Rocket's like one of the and I can be totally wrong about this because this is only in the context of characters that I've seen in the Marvel Universe but Rocket seems like one that does seem kind of suicidally renegade not not in a chaotic chaotic way but it was almost like he kind of just doesn't care about he try, it's almost a defense mechanism he has attachment issues he doesn't attach to a lot of people and he also kind of doesn't care about a general amount of things almost to protect himself which kind of makes sense from what happens in this film so i do agree with that but i think there is one of a character we're missing who actually does portray visually on screen him his the ramifications it's thor like he lost everything and he he went he he went on a a one brain track crusade to take down thanos and then when he lost everything and he still failed at the end he he went into a depression and who's the character that went to meet him in Endgame, it's Rocket. Like, you know, he, you know, Rocket went with, and he, even though, like, you know, there's the connection between the two of them, I would have loved more of the, between those two characters. I think, I think that's yeah. what, you know, Thor, Love and Thunder should have been a bit yeah, more about. Yeah, I, I was disappointed about that uh, they weren't, well, Guardians in general weren't in that more, which I've said 
Well, I mean, part of the review. Rocket got made the captain of the Guardians, so there's there's no reason why Disney won't try that on again. Yeah, to so bring, to bring the Guardians with. I mean, Thor there is something. a comic series called the As. It's it's said in the film, but the As Guardians of the Galaxy that is actually a um yeah. a comic run series. Yeah, that'd be cool to see. Just looping it really briefly back to that um almost death scene, the like the you know the tunnel, you know, um between life and death. I yeah, it really choked me up a little bit because. Yeah, it was almost like it was just what he wanted. It was just like, oh, finally. Like, finally, this chaotic, like, life and this horror. Like, because, I mean, not to delve too deep, but it's like it must be painful life to, like, have all these crude experiments done on you and then have to move around and I mean, and be small at the same time. There was a woman, uh, there was a woman next to me. I don't know if you heard, there was a woman tearing up, like, in that animal experiment when they were, like, you know, experimenting on like there was a woman tearing up in that like it's a really sensitive topic animals are sensitive innocent creatures like they they usually can't communicate that that they want to take part in 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 experimentation like this it's and they typically probably won't like it's it's Mm. a really horrible thing as a counter to that uh not counter to that um but the scene where he frees all the animals i was just like i was cheering in my seat i was like yeah like seeing them all run across the thing that i actually liked about the ending because i i expected the the big bad gets defeated like most marvel films that washes over me now because i i just don't see that as an intrigue i love films with intriguing endings and how things play out in a way you don't expect which is which is always great the the big unknown of like oh something's happened a big twist you know kind of like the end of departed uh, from a uh, scorsese film which i do recommend people watch i'm also going to say if you're looking at uh, superhero movies i'm going to raise you the dark knight yeah um I've, I've lost the train of what Sorry. I was saying. <laughs> but uh, I liked that the end of the movie involved um, all of these, like, you know, all the animals, all of these, like, children, all these, like, rescued people coming to live in this, like, absolutely mad city that's like an old god's floating head space station. Like well, when yeah. it's when nowhere, no one has, nowhere is for when no one has anywhere else to go. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, but... that's, that's what I was actually saying. I've remembered my train of thought. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I don't typically like the the regular endings of the big bad gets gets defeated, but it's the fact of like the the kind of anti the the the, the come down from the climax of the film where they're trying to like save the innocents right, but then there's also like no not everyone has been saved. We're going to save all the animals as well, and then all the animals come like kind of like a stampede of like mm. it's almost like Noah's Ark you know is sinking in even a way. In, even including I forget what they call, but I'm calling, going to call them battery eaters because I remember they said they eat batteries, but the yeah. giant monsters, abelisks or something like that, something like that. But the yeah. giant monsters, monsters that uh, Mantis saves, even they come across, and I'm just like, I mean, did you recognize them from the second film? Yeah, I recognize yeah, yeah. them. Yes, yeah. yeah, they're from the start. But, but the thing again, another another slight character betrayal where a character betrays himself is um, um, high, I'm trying to high evolutionary you're right high it's got to come up with a shorter name for that but the high the high evolutionary would have known that they only eat batteries so why would they have cast them into that pit so I think they still do kill things it's just a case of like because um, they things like the emotional response or like the because in the second movie they were scared they, they were sent to take down one of those creatures because no doubt it was causing chaos and damage and everything which it still probably kills people it's just yeah. the only consumption is battery so like, and that's still they, dangerous uh, if you piss it me, off oh yeah I, yeah. I, I was going to say I want to say quote me if I'm wrong but I want to say hippos are vegetarian but they also kill yeah. the majority of humans yep if I found every other animal also starving that is them a probably. Fair point. Okay. Starving them probably, you know, and uh, if they, if they do the actions, they, they yeah. get given a treat of a battery essentially. That so. reminds me of the line from Snatch where they starve the pigs. Mm. The brick top line is like, if you starve a pig, <laughs> they'll go for a human like bah. But yeah, that's that's <laughs> another thing that Mantis got to do with her powers that was a bit like more developed in this film, where she you know she recognised that and she calmed them down because of the empathy. So. You know, obviously, going going on about raccoon, uh, Rocket Raccoon, um, you know, the ending. Obviously, the raccoon part, because obviously he keeps going from this, uh, I'm not a raccoon, I'm not a squirrel. Yeah. And then he finally comes to accept he is from Earth, and, you know, he is from, you know, like, he, he's from the same location as Quill, which is a nice tie to those two characters for this film being, you know, because obviously, you know, Rocket is from Earth, um, and he's going off into the galaxy, and then Quill, as we're getting to the second, he, he, he was taken, same as well, but he decides to go back. Obviously, you know... I think that's still kind of a 
a strange element to me because it's like it makes sense because he's a sentient raccoon. He's been he's been given sentience in a way, or or some kind of experience. Like because he's got a brain cap on, right? Because they've obviously yeah. jumbled around in his in his ticker up up in his head, like. So, so it kind of makes sense from a character perspective that he he deny that he's a raccoon. It's it's kind of like uh, I guess I guess maybe it's like some kind of acceptance issue. Maybe he himself. just didn't know, like because it was only that I think like the cage that he was probably put in, he didn't have any intelligence like when the cage said raccoon on it and stuff yeah. like that possibly. And then later on in the movie, because he'd never been to Earth up until mm. like recent yeah. years. Um, but also, I think I think it's just a name homage to him finally accepting his name of rocket raccoon like yeah and it's like you know him his identity I've, it was a good line combination yeah i've got to admit it was a really touching scene seeing all the like scared shitless raccoons when he opens the cage with the old with the old um thing and then goes through essentially like they're they're slowly backing off but then they realize that he's kind of one of them and he gets them on and uh, to climb all over him and so he's trying to save them i i liked that piece uh i do like the fact that you know for the movie we don't really get a lot of rocket in the present day until the final third of the movie and then when he finally goes like you know they're on the ship and everything and the guy says i'm done like I, i i'm not running anymore i'm this is it i'm just i'm just and then you know excellent use of the music coming in we'll get into the fight scenes a bit later on which i think were absolutely brilliant in this film um i do want to touch on obviously you know star lord in this movie a lot of people dote on like chris pratt sometimes for his acting ability you know like he he can be like i just comedic he can't really do very heavily emotional roles i think like that scene where rocket just flatlines he he gave like he gave like a terrifying scream out of everything like i i thought he gave a great performance in the movie like Sorry, yeah. No, just the same. Same. I thought it was quite in that scene as well. It was a very emotional scene. Because you know, even when Gamora like gets killed in the previous movies, he he's just angry. Yeah. Like, you know, but he doesn't. He does. He doesn't. He isn't emotionally broken. Like you know, he's lost his mum, his dad, and everything. Now he's lost his best friend, and that's when he just and he lost his girlfriend. He lost he, lost Gamora. Yeah, really. he lost Gamora, he and he technically he, lost, he lost everything. And now his drive in this film is to not lose the, the one thing he does. And then when that happens, he just. He breaks. It was kind of like the one chosen family he has. Yeah. Because yeah. he's lost a, a lot of other family ties. And this is the actual one that he's banded together that actually believes in him and he believes in them. So losing Rocket as an element of that is probably significantly harder because a lot of times Rocket was the voice of reason for a lot of things. Yeah. Mostly because he's astoundingly smart, but also mischievous. So it's it's kind of a funny... It's his brother, essentially. In a way, yeah. Yeah. But I think also, like, going on Star-Lord now, because obviously in, in, he's had this drive in these films to figure out who he is or, you know, find the family and wh- where he belongs. And up until Infinity War, he, he was at that point where he had everything he needed. You know, they were the guardians of the galaxy, they were protecting the galaxy, he had his family, and then they got broken apart in Endgame and Infinity War. Obviously, we see in the holiday special, the break is done, it's coming to a culmination point. At the beginning of this film, he's a drunk now. He he just can't control himself anymore. And I do like the fact that the commentator in the film, like he is, he's he's wasted. Like he yeah. he yeah. he's he's not he's not he's not the sorry he's not the character he was before. And I do like the fact that it takes like you know I love his first interaction with the High Evolution. He's saying just another condescending dick who should take over the fucking galaxy and stuff like that. And like he he's just had enough. He doesn't care anymore. And it, it was it was interesting seeing the the effect of of like. Yeah, the loss of Gamora. Because he has no issue killing that guy to get that information. Yeah, you know what? That was something that kind of occurred to me a few times through the film. They straight up kill people. Um, you oh, know, yeah, they where, both kill people. But I think oh, this film was like more but, personal. Like, remember, like alongside that, there, you know, there's other points in the film where he's also saying to Gamora, "We're not going to hurt people. We're going to do this peacefully. We're going to do this quietly." I so, found that really funny because it was just like throughout the entirety of what was the bio place again the bio I can't remember no, the name bio, it specifically oh I can't, if anyone remembers just cut in with it but the, in in the bio station that they had which also by the way i found was fantastic because it represents an interesting challenge in creating sets right yeah like like mm. it's not something i've really seen in marvel is like entirely biological but yet also somewhat somewhat I want to say contemporary. It's kind of gross. I find it a bit weird and gross. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> Orgocorp. Yeah, yeah. Orgocorp. At the Orgoscope. Oh. <laughs> Orgoscope. What a name. Um, yeah, no, that, that was really, really cool. But um, I lost a train of thought again. 
Just so, um, so obviously, you know, um, with Star Lord, because one thing we haven't really spoken about, I honestly thought characters were going to die in this film. Mm, like, I just yeah. thought Drax. I, I actually thought Drax was going to be the one to go because obviously he was stated before the film came out. He was done with Guardians. He was done with Marvel. So I thought, well, everyone's going, oh, if he's done with Marvel, then like, and also, same. So. But also, also, also watching the film. I mean, there's a few things I want to say here. So. It didn't go over the direction I thought. But I thought they may have, may have gone initially. I thought we were going to go a little bit Suicide Squad at one at one point, because when so it's two, it's two things, I'll, I'll tie back into what I'm about to say here. But first of all, talking about um, Peter Quill being uh, drunk at the start, I when I first saw that scene because he because at the end of that scene he's carried out um, by people. That to me felt like oh my god are they actually going to kill him off because it felt like is this going to be like a callback um to like a later way where he's bought out by his, his dead, dead boy oh so yeah he, he's drunk on this which they didn't do although although they although they almost did yeah they almost did because a bit near the end where you think he's you think think he's dead and he isn't i thought but, he was dead there too yeah but in terms of me, me thinking that they were going to start going actually up I was right, and we're going to start going down that way. Is in the at the end of the August scope where Drax gets shot twice. He's he's been in a really bad way, but um, he's he's on time to survive. I thought they were. I thought at that moment they might be bold and kill off Drax then, and then it was going to be, and that was going to be how the Guardians were going to actually end up splitting up. It's not the direction we went down, but yeah. So then we wouldn't have had the the vehicle at the end where where Drax was presumed dumb, too dumb to know the the the, the language of the species that were being held oh, oh yeah. I mean, I'm I'm glad they didn't go down that route, which was um, actually quite so. nice because it was playing into the characters' flaws that they just thought Drax was just too. Don't get me wrong. I love the direction that the film went. Yeah. Um, I I I I just at that point thought that maybe they were going to go down a different way, which which yeah. they didn't. So, um, as you're going on, you know, the Drax point, because obviously, you know, he's always been known as Drax the Destroyer, but now he's Drax the Father. And one thing I thought they might have done in the film is he took on this protective role and obviously he lost his family and his daughter and everything in previous films. I thought that probably would have been the um, the drive for... Um, him dying and something like protecting mm. basically the thing he, he couldn't protect in the sacrifice yeah. he, he was, was going just, to he was mostly driven by revenge in the in the early films yeah for so Thanos, as soon as yeah. what was it yeah Thanos because Thanos contributed to the death of all yeah, of his people it was, uh, it was, um, so whenever he saw Thanos or anything related to Thanos he just had blood, blood red him, haze I over him just right? want to make one observation if they had killed off Drax then his name would be uh, would become Drax the Destroyed yeah Oh, I was going to say Drax the Savior Towers is like oh. uh, <laughs> but no so um, obviously you know with Star-Lord um, I do like the fact that it literally culminates in him returning to his grandfather because obviously he was the last human he saw before he left which is interesting because I thought he would have probably come to Earth in that time frame since he was back which would have been interesting maybe it's just still too painful um, um, and I do like the end of the movie I pointed out to you guys so obviously in the comic books there's a thing of where um, Star Lord does have his own comic book run, and obviously we know now he will return. So he's the actual only confirmed character too. Um, a lot of people saying he's going to play a major part in the Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars movies that which are coming out. But I do like the fact, which I noted, the font of his character changed from the Guardians general font. There is it's more like a a, a neon a neo style like sci sci more heavily sci fi font, which is actually how it is in the comic books, which I thought was really interesting. One thing I would have, which I would like, is for them to take the element of like his blasters in the comic books are elemental blasters, so they have like fire, lightning, and everything. I would have liked them, maybe them to adapt that in future versions, possibly an upgrade for him. Mm. Uh, we I could see a time skip thing where we can just it, they'll probably getting... like rebrand most of his equipment and everything like that. Well, with the Kang Dynasty, time is a major element into itself. Yeah. Like you know how how it can I'm be adjusted. I'm totally unfamiliar. So well, with Ant Man and Quantum Mania, basically he basically um, Kang is the master of time. Essentially, he can right. make all the adjustments. He's in Loki as well. A first shirt has been out for almost two years now, people. So, is the main opposing element to that leading the charge like Doctor Strange? He, he, uh, so, we don't, no one knows this at the moment. People think it will be Doctor Strange. It could be um, uh, Shang-Chi as a possible element in that because he possibly links as well to the right. future of Marvel. Um, no one really knows going forward. Ant Man is a big proprietor to possibly because he. His um, rivalry with Kang, which is quite interesting, could play a major part going forward. But Star Lord, 
I think would be an interesting take as well, possibly, because he's led a team already. Um, so, obviously, you know, one thing is the high evolutionary, as standard with him, usually with Marvel movie, he does die. Now, we don't actually see him die. We see the ship blow up, but we don't see him die. We see his face off, which is fucked up. Like, that, that was the scene where I was like, oh, no, this is quite... And going back to our review, you state about the 15 of it. Now, I always go back to this for movies of fame. In Revenge of the Sith, you see a character burn alive on screen in a 12A, which I was shocked they did at the time. Obviously, this movie is much more visceral in its like visuals of it. But I think people are a lot more dis- really desensitized to that nowadays, which is really shit to say. But um, that's specifically in America as well. It, it's more sex in America. Violence is allowed more than sex, whereas over here, it's, it's the opposite, which is more known. Um... One theory going around is though is that to keep the to keep the high evolutionary around, um, obviously there's this whole controversy at the moment with Jonathan Majors and Kang going forward and everything, because there are many variants of Kang. What if you rewrote the high evolutionary to be a variant of Kang? So you, the person taking over the role would be uh, Chukwati, which I think would be an mm-hmm. excellent. No, so I mean I I, I think high evolu- evolutionary. He's a best, way, way better villain than Kang, uh, from what I've seen. I I, I didn't massively jive with uh, the last last uh, um, Ant Man film, but the the, the, the the different characters. I don't want them to try and make the highly different evolutionary Kang. It would be awkward. I I did think Kang personally. I really enjoyed Kang as a villain, but um, yeah, high evolutionary is. It's more so casting. I know what you mean, yeah, but it would be weird. Well, like he made an impact yeah. with how he looked in that film, that it would no, be weird. I might be controversial here, but I always say innocent before proven guilty. About uh, yeah. any, any case, anyways. I don't but, like to speculate because it, it, it uh, personally because it will depend on yeah, how, exactly. it, how it's going to play I'm, out. I'm, I'm, I mean, exactly. But if I do have to recast, um, if, you have, if we do have to recast, recast, and in, in, in that instance, I would be. Okay, I'd be okay with it. So I'd say yes. bring in someone whose face we don't already know, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just it is it is a frustrating. But I know some people speculate something how like there are multiple a- actors, superheroes, even like there's variants of Doctor Doom which are Kang, which links to Kang and everything, and Kang links to Fantastic Four and everything. So there's a whole massive thing there. So it wouldn't be difficult for them to slightly tweak it to make that happen because obviously you know Kang manipulates time high evolution and manipulates evolution there's a, there's a, there is a connection point that they could have oh, there oh yeah i'm sure and from a story point of view it makes sense i'm just saying from a human nature you recognize what people look like point of view well it's it also just weird. the actor i think a lot of people loved this actor and they just don't like how Christian Bell was underutilized heavily underutilized for thor love and thunder it would have it would have been great to have him more for Chuck Waddy, a lot of people want him basically oh, around more christian, essentially christian bale was like you know when you apply for a job and they tell you you're overqualified for a role? Yeah. Like, my <laughs> yes. God, did Christian Bale just steal every scene in a good way? Every scene. It was just, yeah, he was a, a fantastic enemy. Like, chilling. Well, I thought it was, I, I, character, character wasn't done well, though. Um, mm. Gore wasn't done well, so, in my opinion. Underutilised, yeah. like we said. Yeah, I agree, yeah underutilised is a really good way of putting it, I especially that, considering how good Christian Bale is. Yeah. I think one thing, you know, going forward, obviously we have a new Guardians team now with um, yes. Adam Warlock, Kraglin, uh, a character called Fila, who's actually a big, a very big Marvel character. How we have, like, she's in the combo, she's the daughter of Captain Marvel, the original version of that character, and Blurp um, as well is part of the team. Which uh, Blurp? Which one's Blurp? That, that little creature with Adam Warlock. Like, oh, the uh, the, the right. animal thing. And He's then the we have... Mascot. And then we have massive Groot, which yeah. was. I want to, yeah, I want to talk about um, that first post credit scene with with yeah the uh, the new team. I, that, I I really like the team. I like the 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 promise of it. I like that in Guardians Three they each gave them little introduction phrase apart from perhaps the the child character, which I don't think we saw much of really. Um, so that little bit there, um, I think has given enough intrigue and they're enough different to the previous team that I would like to see what they do with it especially Cosmo and is it Adam Warlock yes so yeah. I can say it, it is specified in the film because Adam Warlock actually in the comic books is a stupidly powerful character but they do say in this film he isn't finished yet mm-hmm. so I think that's why 
he wasn't utilized as much as film. It's sort of his introduction. Yeah. They could have done it a but bit better. They could have done it. They could have done it better because the the, the strands of the story, which uh, involving him, which I felt weren't were explored as heavily as I thought. I, and, yeah, and it, and it is a whole hit, whole them whole setup with them having to take a uh, rocket and, and and bring it back. That was great, but there's only like one small scene where they, where that really tried to do that, and it kind of like felt like it petered out too early. Yeah, I I do agree with you. I do think that they could have used him more, but from what they have showed, I'm excited to see what they do with that character. Well, there was two, though, wasn't there? Because there was the initial kickoff of the plot at nowhere, and then there was when when yeah. Warlock showed but, up, and then also on Counter Earth, where he shows up again, which causes chaos with the plans to try and save save um, save yeah, Rocket. Yeah, but right? it was. I mean, that was I mean, Counter Earth was really the only. So, okay, two confrontations with the Guardians, but Counter Earth was the only place where they were trying to uh, take control of 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 Rocket, because in the first one it was more because that was set up. Because I think I don't think the first initiation was uh, them trying to take was him trying to take Rocket. Or it was no, it was it was like the whole driving force of her was basically uh, the High Evolutionary had sent the Sovereign Adam Warlock and his mother to get Rocket. If they wanted to save their society, that's why Adam Warlock was oh, sent. Oh, I, I, I thought that was after. No. Um, it wasn't. So that, that was done from the. Okay, that's it's a, it's a very it's a very small throwaway bit. I think like you know, it, but I do think like. So re- re- reason I thought differently was because they kind of set up at the end of the second film that they're after. Well, they're after Rocket and all that stuff because Rocket stole that stuff at the beginning of the second film. So that's what I assumed was the, right. Yeah. Was, was, was the reason for the initial attack, and then that the. the and then I thought after when the high evolutionary meets them afterwards, that's when I thought they were setting it up. But I obviously, um, mis- I've only just realised it now as well, and it's kind of funny. But um, the the warlock was dumb as bricks and almost got rocket killed. Yes, which which also starts off the main plot of the whole film because yeah. all because he just tried to capture rocket almost killed him and completely failed to capture him. Mm. Yeah. So it's true actually it's, yeah and it's it just plays even more funnier into into the the dumb as bricks yeah. aspect so, um obviously you know with the new guardians team um i do like the fact that i'm hoping we do get more adventures if it isn't another film we might just get them in like in other plot points possibly you know the team goes around and assists in other movies which i wouldn't be averse to but i would like um them to have another movie exploring yeah. the dynamic in regards to that no marvel they probably will do that but yeah having them show up like the previous guardians did in other more main uh mainline movies in marvel would be would be cool too i'd like that yeah i'm probably done <laughs> I'm I I'm just going to go in with massive skepticism if I watch another Guardians film. I think yes, maybe we'll follow more of the Peter Quill Star Lord story, but as as far as like this kind of arc of Guardians, I've I've enjoyed it thoroughly. The characters that have come in and out of the group, or, or essentially the group growing and and how it's kind of played out. I'm just not sure. It would really depend on what the setup would be for the next one. If there was to be a volume four so, or some kind of team up, but pretty much wrapping it up on that point, actually, uh, one small thing I do want to mention is I do think near the end of the film they do have an amazing fight sequence, like oh god, yeah, absolutely stunning fight. That sequence. was super cool. Yeah. Can I just talk really briefly, which is part of this fight sequence? Sure. But the enemy design for War Pig, and I, I can't remember what the name of the other the two animal guards, but at the, end. the two the Beep. two guards yeah. they were specifically showcased at the. Yeah, yeah. There's a chilling scene on Beep the Bob bridge. What's the name of the ship? The uh, high evolutionary ship again. I couldn't. I couldn't remember. But essentially, on the bridge up to the high evolutionary ship, there's obviously like a, a guard stop. A, you know, a, 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 a roadblock. Yeah, and th- they're both standing there, and it just cuts to a static shot. A static shot of both of them, and and it's something about monstrous creature design with kind of pin red. You know, like the Terminator eyes with like pin red light eyes with hollowed out where you can't exactly fully see the eye socket. It's some, it's so chilling. It's very rare as well, especially showing that in Marvel as well. Because I imagine some of the younger Marvel fans would probably be, if it, if it creeped me out, which mm. usually I'm desensitized to a lot of monster and character design, but it really just creeped me out whenever we saw them on screen and their, and their faces. But then the fight scene was, was really, really good. It did feel like a lot of it, a lot of that was way more floaty, but I guess that's just Marvel's style, where 
it was a really cool continuous shot and it reminded it me of the good. shot from John Wick 3 actually a little bit because it was like a very it was one shot right yes for, for quite it was, some time and even 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 if it wasn't a full shot in cinematography they do have classifications of a one shot but they have extremely smart tricks mm. to continue the shot which I, I imagine know that, that probably would have happened pr- yeah exactly but it was just really cool to see each uh, guardian member like taking out um enemies with their own unique like abilities basically it was yeah it was a cool shot and i know yes. and I, I know like one trick when we're doing like a one shot thing sometimes i think like Birdman sometimes did it was like you, you, you tilt the camera down so you can like look away so so like a very short scene where it's so short um moment where there's no characters in sight and that's your basically cut so, for instance, in, in like Bird Birdman, there's a scene where you're where Mark Keaton's walking outside, and there's a very small, tiny little bit where it's looking at a pavement, and then it's back up and following Mark Keaton. So it looks like it's all in one shot. But I mean, it wouldn't surprise me anyway if a great deal of that shot was all just green, green yeah. screen. Uh, so I can say that that hallway is actually practical. The, the only, the only. The only CGI green screen was the actual, like, the entrance section. Because the final photo for the team, which uh, Jason yeah. shared online, is that team in that hallway. So, okay. yeah, it's um, I'd say it's more of a mix of green screen elements in regards to probably the side panels, but also um, one-shot tricks and how that works. Cause there's, because there's... But I will say, like, you are definitely right in, like, how each team member gets a specific fight sh- to show their un- uniqueness. And I love how Rocket... He, there's a very popular pose of him jumping in the air with a gun, mm. which we do get that shot specifically. And also, I think, you know, in the previous movie, Star-Lord, it seems it's a bit of a, um, you know, we see a lot of him joking and just moving and shooting. But in this movie, we do get to see him, like, properly move like a soldier to a degree, like how he how he moves and, like, his vision. And, yeah, I thought it was brilliant. It would have been cool if there was, like, a few more screw-ups in that almost like humbling in nature like if, if way more hits were taken on on the guardian side because it's kind of like suddenly especially considering how the warlock fight went early on where they all just got wrecked it was kind of it would have been a little bit more humanizing to me to see them like take a few more hits because then suddenly they're just perfectly competent at everything they're doing by the way it's 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 a perfect like guns and glory bit in the film it is satisfying really satisfying to watch i know what you mean it just feels less grounded it it does kind of like this is the third movie and they have kind of learned a lot over the time that they've been together and come together as a team so i agree it's kind of unrealistic but like it is like a visual showcase of that progression as a team and as skilled fighters. It's almost like the here comes the circus type deal. I think it also goes into, I was actually literally about to link to that point in regards to it's the, it's their, it's their end point. It's their, like they finally accepted who they all are and they, they know who they are and they, they flow so well together. Gamora was probably, you know, the, she's the outlying element, but for Mm. the rest of the, because also if you notice, she has probably the, she only has like one specific character. She fights in that actual fight. Whereas every other character has much more flow between them. They, you know, the, and also we get that lovely shot of Groot, uh, Rocket on Groot's arm again, which we got in the first movie to talk back yeah. to. And it just shows the flow between them. But speaking of flow, though, I think I think that's the end of the episode, people. I think I think we're going to wrap it up there. Obviously, you know, we give this movie a um, eight eight point five uh, eight, ten eight ish, yeah, an eight eight ish. I might I might ride that like a this is an eight ish movie. Yeah. But yeah, no. Uh, so obviously, you know, I want to thank uh, Taz for joining us today for his uh, lovely first episode. Hopefully, he had a good time. Yeah, it was. Uh... It was fun. It was fun. Uh, maybe we can talk more in more generalistic sense with with like broader topics. I'd like to maybe join in on a few. Who knows when I'll be coming back? But yeah, it was it was that's nice to talk about, about the podcast. movies. Thank you, folks. Thank you, James. Thank you, Chaz. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, that's a good thing about this podcast, people. You know, we don't always have a consistent you know round of people come on because it gives everyone free time to come about and also just hop on when they want to. So yeah, um, I want to again thank uh, Chaz and James for joining as well today. Yeah, it's been good. Cheers, mate. Yeah, thank you, man. It's been good to uh, talk about a film. I've missed the last few, so yeah, nice to uh, all get on board with Guardians 3. Obviously, we've been waiting for it for a while, so it's good to uh, go well, for it. I, you, we may have Towers back in a month, actually, for the next movie coming out for Across the Spider-Verse, because that's in a month's time. Oh, is that the... Um... The the spider the, the yeah yeah not going to make the mistake of not seeing that one in the cinema maybe even IMAX or something yeah 
that was really good the first one i uh, definitely i definitely think that's a group cinema trip i think there i definitely agree with that uh, imax especially mm-hmm. so yeah but on that note people if you've got any questions queries or compliments please email us at nmipodcast.com that's nmipodcast.com find our socials on twitter and instagram at nmicast or just search uh, NMI cast on Google and you'll find us there um, again I've been your host Nate I want to thank my host for joining me today and uh, yeah enjoy the weekend people we will see you next time stay safe everyone bye bye bye